All right, so let's start with a reading from Job. So, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A reading from the book of Job. Then Job answered and said, How long will you afflict me, grind me down with your words? These ten times you have humiliated me, have assailed me without shame. Even if it were true that I am at fault, my fault would remain with me. If I cry out violence, I am not answered. If I shout for help, there is no justice. God has barred my way and I cannot pass. He has stripped me of my glory and taken the diadem from my brow. He breaks me down on every side. He has uprooted my hope like a tree. He has kindled his wrath against me. He counts me as one of his enemies. My family has withdrawn from me. My friends are wholly estranged. My relatives and companions neglect me. My guests have forgotten me. My breath is abhorrent to my wife, and I am loathsome to my very children. Even the young child despises me. When I appear, they speak against me. All my intimate friends hold me in horror. Those whom I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin. Oh, would my words be written down? Would they be inscribed in a record that with an iron chisel and with lead they are cut in the rock forever? As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. This will happen when my skin has been stripped off and my flesh, I will see God. Amen. Amen. Now, the thing I like about the book of Job is that if you're ever too happy, just (laughs) go right there. I'll siphon it off right there. Uh, (laughs) I'm thinking about changing up for the Christmas Mass, for the children's Mass. (laughs) But actually, I really do like it. Um, And I love that line where, you know, his friends, they keep blaming him. And he is insistent. He knows God. Yes, God has done, seems to have done this horrible thing, he says. And yet, when it says, I know my Redeemer lives, actually, um, the word in Hebrew is goel, which really means defender. Um, he knows God will live. And so it says, I want my words writ- carved in stone. He just believes in God, despite the fact that, really, he's lost everything. And this is the odd part. Job, despite suffering and rejection, he wants to be judged by God. I just think that's a real, like, in that, like, if you came to the end of your life, despite whatever sins you may have committed, saying, no, I want God to test me and judge me. I want my, I believe in God. Isn't that a great, like, I know it's depressing, but it's also kind of great. Um, I guess you guys don't think so, but, um, <laughs> so, we're at the book of Job. Um, Job, again, is wisdom literature. And if going off my character stretch, sketch, if Proverbs is this kind of confident, optimistic art teacher, and Koheleth is this rather cynical lawyer, Job is a very old, humble man who actually is hopeful and accepts suffering and loss. And even though he's lost everything, for the majority of it, he has no anxieties. He's not, he's not carefree about it, but he accepts his suffering. And so it's a hard book, I really do have to admit. Probably not very popular, and yet I believe it is a, a must read if you want to gain wisdom. If you want to gain wisdom, you have to deal with suffering and loss. And that's why, to be honest, I, I love the book of Job. Um, I really think it's a must for gaining wisdom because sooner or later all of us will be there with Job and we'll be losing far more than we gain. Uh, We'll have sickness and suffering um, and your attitude on it really does matter. So a quick overview of Job. The story is set in this kind of obscure land. Um, It's far away from Israel, Uz. Nobody knows where it is, and so it may be fiction. 
And the main character, Job, is not Hebrew. He's not an Israelite. He's not part of the chosen people. And this should shock you. He's not part of the whole chosen people, but um, he is very humble, and God proclaims him as the holiest human being. His name, Job, technically means foreigner. So uh, I mention this because um, wisdom literature is not written for a specific religion, Judaism or Catholicism. It's written for all humanity. Um, and some say, now, is it a true story or is it a fiction? And yes, there is fiction in the Bible. Um, really doesn't matter. Um, the story is not set in any clear time period. And this seems to be intentional because it's not meant for a particular people. It's meant for all humanity. And like its author, it, I guess it doesn't want us to be distracted by historical or denominational um, questions, but really focus on the story of God and the question and experience of what suffering is and what justice is. And so the plot is pretty clear. The plot um, has a very clear literal, literal design. And it opens with this kind of short prologue and then really closes with an epilogue. <laughs> and the central body is this just dense Hebrew poetry that is basically this conversation between Job and four people who call themselves the friends. Um, and the conversations, um, it ends with actually God appearing before Job or Job appearing before God and God kind of summing everything up. Now the odd part with Job is that there's a lot of really rare Hebrew words in it and it's so rare that it's very difficult to translate. A lot of times you'll see an asterisk says, we have no idea what the word here. <laughs> yeah. I, I noticed that so that as the scroll itself was not well stored. It, it could be, so. but just there's a lot of words that we don't know what the Hebrew is. There's a lot of borrowed Persian words. So is this a Hebrew story originally or a Persian word story translated into Hebrew that um, is a holdover. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and it may be such an ancient story that a lot of these words are lost to time. Um, or is it an attempt to make the story look ancient by looking, using such ancient words that they've fallen out of favor? Does that make sense? So there's a lot of foreign words, a lot of very ancient words. Just for the heck of it, I don't care. Um, I like to think that it is a story that is for the universal mankind, but also, even if it's not ancient, I like to think that it's so ancient it gains wisdom for everybody. And the story starts with this prologue, and the prologue um, introduces Job, and Job is clearly a very blameless, upright man. Um, he honors God, he's very good, he makes sacrifices to God. Um, every day. Now, what's just interesting about that, that uh, if you notice an Adam and Eve uh, story that right from the beginning, human beings made sacrifices to God, um, and Job is in line with that. He always makes, in fact, he makes sacrifices for any sins that he may have committed that he didn't commit. Like, he's just so pure. Um, and he's a super good guy. And then we're transported uh, kind of to heaven where God God is holding court and in heaven and this is going to sound strange but this is kind of a um, common Old Testament way of describing how God runs the world that God has a committee <laughs> um, and he's holding it and he's there with all the heavenly hosts and um, a Satan comes up uh, I know that sounds strange, but a Satan comes up. And the word Satan, that's technically the word. Satan means accuser or prosecutor. And a Satan is there. And God says to, I'm just going to keep saying Satan because I like it. But um, <laughs> says to Satan, ah, oh, did you see my boy Job? Um, he is the best of the human beings. Um, and that is true, he really is. Uh, he's 
known as the most holy. And even uh, Ezekiel will praise the three most holy human beings in human history. And Job is listed as one of the three most holy human beings of history, of human humankind. And I think it's Moses and I forget. Maybe Mary. No, no, Mary's in the New Testament. Um, I think it's St. Leonard, but I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, but the, also, um, the word Satan, Satan, it doesn't mean at this point, um, it's not a proper name for an individual. So when it says Satan, don't think it means the devil. You can, and that's a Christian interpretation. But tech, technically, it doesn't say the, um, the Satan, it says a Satan. And that should strike you as kind of strange because, um, you know, that should strike you as really strange because we have this theology that Satan is this, you know, hairy buttocks host of hell. Um, but we're like, that's a developed, that gets into the whole theology of evil. That's a developed theology. Now, the Hebrews originally didn't have that God was all there is. And you could choose evil, but that's her choice. They didn't really, if you look at, they didn't put a lot on uh, that somehow there's evil forces and uh, a Satan and devil. That actually is not an ancient Hebrew theology. That's more developed. But also, likewise, you don't really have much, there's no real promise in heaven in ancient um, Hebrew theology. I know that sounds strange, but um, you're good because you were meant to be good, not because you get a reward in heaven. And the Hebrews really didn't have much of uh, evil figures like devils and demons and Satans. They didn't have that because, let's face it, if Chris chooses to do evil, it's because Chris chooses to do evil. Does that make sense? You're not seduced into it, so stop blaming people. <laughs> um, <laughs> Does it, well, it is your favorite fault. Um, does that make any sense? And the other thing is, a Satan is an accuser. And this sounds is going to sound really strange, but there are good angels that are called a Satan, such as in the Old Testament where the angel stops the mule, if you remember that story. It says it's acting as a Satan. A Satan is somebody who blocks your way, uh, somebody who opposes the system. Does that make sense? Later on, it's going to become the Satan. Uh, but technically, any human beings, good angels, can be a Satan. Anybody who simply blocks or says, now wait, let's stop and let's examine this. Does that make sense? Is that like a cynic? No, it's more of a prosecutor who wants to test things. And the Satan, what <laughs> the Satan wants to do is um, the angels come back and they report how things are going on earth. And to the angel who may it may be Satan as we know it but we'll just say the person who's in charge of prosecuting human beings actions uh, comes up and God says to him did you see my boy Job you know he is the best of the human beings and the Satan challenges God's policy of rewarding uh, to the righteous like Job and so Satan's position is, well, he's only good because you give him good things. Um, let's challenge that system of justice. You know, that if you, if you give him bad things, he'll turn on you. And God, who says no, because I'm all-powerful, I know all things, um, Job will not turn. And so Satan challenges him, and God agrees that he'll let the accuser <laughs> inflict suffering on Job. And at this point in the story, most of us will say, what? what? Why did God do that? Why, does, you know, why would God allow Satan to do whatever he wants? He's just not allowed to kill him. Why would God allow evil to happen to good people? But to be honest, if you read the book, it doesn't answer the question. Um, that's not answered. Uh, you'll answer a different question. And the prologue is set up that the real question it's trying to get at is whether God is just, whether God operates the universe according to justice. 
And the other issue is, why does God allow good people to suffer? Um, and the odd part is, um, the ultimate reason for Job's suffering is never revealed. The thing that's revealed is the bad answers to suffering. Those will be mocked by the three, three friends, and Job loses everything. Uh, loses absolutely, even his wife tells him to curse God and die. And the odd part is um, it criticizes the bad theology of suffering. It doesn't completely answer why there is suffering. Um, and the three friends, when um, it's F, F, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they're also non-Israelites. They're non-Hebrew, uh, like him. But they offer kind of the best ancient Near East theology on suffering. And they're all wrong. And I have to admit, that you still get these theologies today. I At least every six months, I have somebody who comes and says, well, I just don't believe in God because my grandfather got cancer. Or... Why would God allow the Syrians to suffer so much? If you say God, does that make sense? Like, the question is always being asked in every generation. Um, and to be a wise person, you should think about this. Or the other extreme, this is also one of the theologies, is, and it's a bad theology, is... Um, like I met this guy who works at Costco and um, used to be Catholic but now he's an evangelical and he wanted um, my opinion on something and he's living with his girlfriend so I said well you're going to burn in hell um, no I didn't say that um, he's living with his girlfriend and his pastor said you know you're living with your girlfriend and um, God is going to get mad and God is going to inflict suffering on you and he said, is that true? Because he was really worried. And he said, his pastor made the image that, um, what would you do if your dog constantly disobeyed you? Wouldn't, wouldn't you punish it? So God is going to punish you. And I know. <laughs> so like he said, no, God is pure love. God, you know, God thinks us we're more than a dog to God. To, like, God loves us incredibly. God allows suffering, but that doesn't mean... That begs the question of what, what does an evangelical say to Job, who is so, you know, loving and perfect and holy, right? Mm -hmm. And all these horrible things happen to him. Like, that doesn't play out well with what their theology is, does it? No, but to, if you notice, um, I don't mean to be cruel. Evangelicals, I'm working my way to the coffee. <laughs> Evangelicals, no, they, of the wisdom literature, there's only one book that they really ever quote. Which one is that? Proverbs. 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 Oh, really? They never really deal with suffering. Their idea of suffering, as you'll see, is really what one of the friends is, which um, you deserve it if you've done something wrong. Right. But what kind of image of God is that? That God is that mean spirited? You're, you're just a well trained dog. Yeah. So, that, like, they don't deal with wisdom literature. Um, I have to clear something that she said. Because I, I live that every day. Old Testament is good in a little way for the new evangelicals. Because all they believe is in the New Testament. And a God that is, so, uh, and a Jesus Christ that is so good that he's forgiven everything. Because it's just love. Whatever is back there, uh, God that he was so rough and doing so much punishment, that doesn't apply anymore. It's Jesus Christ. You could say that, but if Jesus, no offense. But I'm not saying no, no, no. But they could say that. But think about this. Jesus is a wisdom figure. Jesus will be like Job, who will accept suffering, who will be <laughs> suffer, even though he's innocent. So m my conclusion is going to be Jesus is a type of Job, or Job is a type of Christ. Does that make sense? Like, and all of us, at one point of our life, we're going to be, maybe not right now for me, because the worst I have is baldness, bad eyesight, and arthritis, <laughs> but we'll get to that point. What, what, hey, hey, no making fun of this height. Um, um, no, I don't have good hearing. I just know that one. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> that put the fear of God in her. Um, but like, yeah, they, they do dismiss the Old Testament, but the theme is still right there in the life of Christ. So you're not going to get around it. So just how this goes is um, the whole thing is the dialogue of the friends. And at first, there's three friends. So total, there's four. But the fourth one is also this Christ-like figure. The first three, not such great people. And Job speaks first. Um, and Job is going to speak, and then their friends are going to um, give a response back. And it's back and forth, back and forth in response uh, and accusations. Um, and the whole debate is, God, is God just? Does God run the world according to a strict, strict principle of justice? And what about suffering? Do you deserve it? And we're going to see that um, Job and his friends are working from this huge assumption that God's justice works according to what they want to see in the world. That every little thing that happens in the um, Universe happens according to their interpretation of justice. So if you're a wise and good person and honor God, then good things will happen to you, is the friend's position. And God will re reward you. This is the very thing that the Satan wants to challenge. And if you're evil and stupid and do evil things, then obviously God will punish you and bad things will happen to you. And so the friends have this overdeveloped sense of justice that really blames the victim for being poor or sick or suffering. And Job's constant argument throughout the speech is, um, first of all, he's innocent. And um, that this is not punishment. He is innocent, but it, uh, they just refuse to accept it. And they'll say, well, you must have done something. Um, and if you remember, God says at the very beginning, Job is innocent. And so the sad part is, after the three friends, Job concludes by accusing God that either God doesn't run the world according to justice, or even worse, God just doesn't care. Um, and the friends, on the other hand, they want to say that's a horrible thing to say. Their argument is God is just, which when you hear that, you kind of think, well, that's a theologically right position because God is just, right? But they're wrong. The implication that God runs the world according to justice as they conclude it. So you can't accuse God. And that Job must have done something really, really bad. Um, and Job protests all this. And he, he keeps going back and forth, I'm innocent. Or I don't, want to I don't want to believe this, but maybe God is not just. Um, and the three friends come to comfort Job. Because in case you didn't read it, Job... He's doing great. He has everything. And then um, he loses his wealth. And then he loses his children. And then the third thing is that he gets incredibly sick. He sits on a dung heap um, just to get relief from the pain. And so his life really can't get any worse. And the comforters, the three friends, they come with, and this is the dangerous part, they want simple, easy solutions. To suffering and evil. And they promote this blame theology that God has condemned them. And the odd part is that Job is part of the unchurched, but he's the most faithful. Um, and it's a warning to be very careful about inflicting bad theology on people who are suffering. And in the end, I'll get to this, God is going to make the three friends live out their own theology. Job, on the other hand, he he does actually question, and he does it in three rounds. So at first he starts out strong, but then he his, um, kind of is a slow loss into complaining. So the first round, he loses everything. He cuts his hair. That's why I cut my hair. Um, <laughs> and he gives that great line, naked I came into the world, naked I will leave. You know, blessed be the name of God. You know. At first, he loses everything, and he's fine with it. He accepts it without complaining. In the second round, after the, uh, the loss of his health, and his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, it's really quite cruel. Like, that opening where he's lost his closest friends, even his wife, 
Um, and Job still doesn't complain. On the third round, Job's friends come, and at first they're silent because they just want to be with him. But then they start tag teaming, accusing Job. And Job defends himself, but he eventually just quits speaking to him. <laughs> um, and he, he basically says, God seems to be mock, mocking those who are suffering. And finally, he takes up his case directly to God. Now, there's something to be aware is, is that Job really is on this emotional roller coaster. And these are poems. And he used to think that God is just, but he can't reconcile it with his constant loss and suffering. And so, in this outburst, Job is going to accuse God of being a bully. And once he decides that, um, that God has orchestrated all this injustice of the world, but the moment he utters the thought that God is a bully, he's terrified of it. And he wants hope, and he wants to believe in God. Um, so in one section, he's kind of all over the place. Does that make sense? Um, and he makes this one last statement of his innocence, and then he demands that God shows up. And the point being is that, as I said, this will be our question someday. What kind of policy does God have towards the good and suffering? Job and all of us will have to wrestle with the issues of justice and just how God works. Is it a cause and effect or not? And if God is good, then answer me. Why do the good suffer? Um, is God cruel? Is God indifferent to our suffering? Um, Proverbs says that the good will be rewarded. Proverbs never says that the good will never suffer. Um, and that's a mistake the friends make. You know, like, nowhere does it say that the good won't suffer. Whereas the nature of God, justice... Um, so at this point, um, uh, another friend shows up, a fourth one. Now, this is a really enigmatic figure. He's not like the other three. In fact, in my opinion, he's almost as foreshadowing of Christ. I think Job is too, but so is his fourth friend. And his name is Elihu. And Elihu, his name means um, my, God, my God is he. Um, he's proclaiming God um, anyhow. You can hear El means God. Does that make sense? So Elihu, my God is he. He actually critiques Job's theology and he critiques the friends. And he said, both of you do not have a nuanced understanding of suffering. Now he's not Israelite, but the odd part is he has a Hebrew name, um, which has to me this Christ-like figure, Christ origins is obviously Hebrew, but he's not <clears throat> just for the Jews. And Elihu argues that God is just and implies that God always operates the universe according to justice, but he has a more sophisticated conclusion of why God suffer, why people suffer. Now, maybe God is just, but maybe suffering is not punishment for sins or punishment in the past. Maybe uh, God inflicts suffering really as a way to help people avoid sin. And sometimes God allows pain and suffering to build character and to teach people valuable lessons on what's important in life and teach the next generation to wake up and understand what's important in life. Elihu doesn't claim to know why Job is suffering. But the one thing he's certain of is that Job is wrong to accuse God of being unjust or a bully, or even God as being indifferent to suffering. He says that good things often come out of suffering, and that suffering may prepare you for gifts yet unreceived. It may have nothing to do whether you're good or bad. It may prepare you to become more disciplined to receive something else. So he offers a much more broader and complex, nuanced understanding of suffering. And I know that sounds strange, but that's our theology. Uh, like, and I know that sounds strange. Um, like, I told him the story of my dad. My dad really had everything life could offer. Um, uh, he was just intellectually brilliant. 
Uh, he had five masters, four masters and a PhD. Um, he really was brilliant. He was athletically gifted. He was 6'3", great at sports. Um, he's in the Montana Hall of Fame for sports. Um, beautiful skier. Um, it was very important for him to gain money, and so luckily he did. Um, except one, well, anyhow, it doesn't matter. He contracts ALS, and I told you, sorry, he contracts ALS, and he is furiously angry for the first month. I actually stopped speaking to him. Um, and then this the most amazing thing happened is that um, I went up, I went up to visit him and um, he was so joyful. And anyhow, I was saying goodbye to him and says, you know, don't feel sorry for me for having ALS. He said, the best thing God has ever done for me in my entire life is give me ALS. And he said, the only time I was really happy in my life was when you were all small children. And he was, that's what, like, this sounds crazy, but we we're very poor. And he says, when you're poor, when we were poor and us, that was the happiest time in my life. And my dad at that time, he was very happy. He used to hug us kids so hard it'd take your breath away and you didn't want to really have him hug you because he squeezed so hard. <laughs> and you'd squeeze really hard and say, you know, I love you. I love you so much. Well, then... Actually, things got worse. Um, and then he developed a drinking problem. His marriage was on the rocks. Um, then he gains ALS. And for the years that he'd ha have ALS, he would always end every telephone call with, I love you, I love you so much. But really, he is right. He said the best thing God ever did to him was give him ALS. And he said, all my life, I've been nothing but an angry man. Like. The best, uh, so that's Elihu's uh, theology of suffering, that maybe it prepares you for something greater. Um, now, I kind of struggle with that answer because it's hard to tell somebody who's suffering cancer or loss that, well, maybe this is the best thing that's ever happened to you. You look cruel and indifferent. You look like one of the three friends. But Elihu, and I like this, uses the analogy of tunneling for gold. He said, Human beings are the only animal that tunnels for gold. <laughs> and I just think that's funny. He says, but think of that, like Hokama. Um, and why here? Because it previews God's um, answer about mining for gold. That really, you want to mine for Hokama, wisdom. That it, it's all around you, but you have to mine for it. In the same way you would mine for gold, mine suffering and loss for real wisdom um, that most people don't even get. So maybe the world is not complete chaos and meaningless. Maybe there's great wisdom in suffering is his point. Um, and the point of Elihu is that it's better to trust God than to blame the victim, even if you're suffering. His point is that one has to mine through a lot of mud and suffering to find the gold there. And so Job doesn't respond to Elihu in the dialogue. Um, it's kind of one-sided. But Job is just, he's, he's not silent because like his, the three friends, he's angry at what they have to say. Clearly, Job doesn't know how to process this. Does that make sense? Um, so he does, you know, Job is the one who says, God, you coward, you show up. You're a bully, you're indifferent, show up. And then all of a sudden, God shows up in a whirlwind, which I love that image that you think there's going to be this clear image of God. Maybe maybe God is a whirlwind that you can't quite answer. But I love Job's reaction because when God shows up, I mean, Job is kind of angry and saying, show up. So suddenly God shows up and Job drops to his knees and puts his hand over his mouth and says, basically in this gesture saying, I didn't quite know you are that big. <laughs> um, I mean, I love it because God says, no, no, Job, <laughs> you called me unjust and incompetent in running the universe. Now, you know, like, that, is ball that takes balls, I'm sorry. Um, uh, he says, no, yeah, you, you, wanna, you want me to answer your questions? Well, here I am. And so God says, I tell you what, I will answer your questions. But first, let's take a tour of creation. And he starts by 
God says, I'll answer your question if you can answer mine. And he says, what's the origins of the cosmos? Where does light live? Um, Job, were you the architect? Did you help the architect of the earth or organize the constellations? And Job, have you ever commanded a sunrise or controlled the weather? Um, and why do animals do this? Why do wild goats do this? Why does um, do they do this? You know, you think you can control the horse, and therefore you think you know everything about all animals. You, like, you can you think you control the horse, and the the, the poetry is you think you control the horse, and therefore you dictate the flights of eagles. Um, like you've overestimated yourself. Um, does that make any sense? And of course, Job can't answer anything. And it reminds me of this cartoon that um, this guy is staring at God, saying, "God." What have you done for me lately? As he breathes the air God created. <laughs> um, and God says, you know, I have my eye on all these details that Job has never even considered. And, you know, just the grazing habits of animals and how animals give birth. Um, now, remember, Job's assumption and his friend's assumption was what it looks like to run the universe according to justice from their point of view. And underneath it is this assumption, is this deeper one that Job's and his friends have enough wide of perspective to understand how God sees the world. And so God's response in this kind of tour of the creation is to deconstruct this assumption that maybe the universe is a lot more vast and complex um, than they understand. And Job has only a small little horizon of his life to judge whether God is being just or not. Maybe he needs to look at it from another angle. And so um, that's what, does that define why the, why the tour of creation? What the uh, suffering is self-afflicted. I'm thinking about the monks, Trappist, uh, Hermits, all live by himself. Basically are pretty tough. Yes. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, they didn't do it, but uh, punishment for themselves or things. Now, I always think that's kind of crazy, where they flagellate themselves, because won't won't life do that to you already? Yeah. Just be patient. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one should be tough in suffering. But, but the best of is, is that the, the best suffering strengthens you, and, uh, uh, and so they... In a sense, they're not suffering enough, and they bring the suffering on themselves. Yeah, I, I, I don't like that, I, where you cause yourself to suffer. That's just my theology. I think life brings it on enough. Um, but I don't think you should shirk from suffering. And like even little tiny things drive me up the wall, where um, I just it just gets me angry that parents drive their kids to school from Paramount Subdivision. like. It's a few blocks for the love of God. Let little princess, <laughs> like, a little bit of cold and walking through the snow is not bad for them. It, like, it toughens them up. Uh, I'm not saying inflict suffering, but don't, don't keep it from them. Does that make any sense? Like, yeah, but don't, don't you think that something can happen to that kid in the way to school? Somebody can snatch them and take them away and the parents are never going to Then have them walk with each other. Do you know how long that line of cars are? <laughs> like, there are more than one kid walking. I, I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, I know, but that's what I'm thinking. If you're walking alone, you could teach him, listen, A, like, learn how to fight. B, don't walk alone. I want you to walk alone. Make sure you always are with somebody. Like, I just, I, I, I don't know. I used to live back to back with the schoolyard, but you cannot jump the fence. My kids were supposed to get up early so they can walk half a block to the school. And a lot of times they were like, Mom, can you drive me? And there goes Mom in Yamis, get the car and drive them. To oh, the you're block. soft. You know, I lived in Montana when I was in grade school, and my parents only twice gave me a ride, to, gave us a ride to school, and that was only because they happened to be going the same direction. Um, like, my parents didn't allow complaining. Yeah, you're just going to have to, like, I just think you're but making. That was not me growing up. Oh. But is it just a different world now? No, yeah. well, I walked five miles to that school. Yeah. Oh, in Belize, I couldn't like Belize and Guatemala. 
those kids will get up early in the morning and walk miles to get to school and then miles back home and then when they get home they have serious work to do like and but education is so prized and here you have to kind of beg and plead and I don't want to get off on that but I just think like yeah the people from Finland have this concept called seesaw which gets translated grit they one of the great things a parent can give their children if they want to succeed is seesaw where like this I was talking to this woman from Finland she says we don't have snow days in Finland <laughs> no if there's you push your way through that that snow drift we're, we're not like i love that but no I, my point being is that i don't think you have to flagellate yourself suffering will come i think what you have to do is encourage people to say no you're And the odd part is what I like about the book of Job is that let's face it at the end of your life there probably is going to be a lot of suffering and loss. So what you want to do is gain a little bit of wisdom and toughness that you can handle it later on in life and then give that as an inheritance to your kids. Um I'm fine dad. Um <laughs> But the other thing um God accuses Job of is he says and I like this he says God um Job would uh God asked Job if he would like to micromanage the world for a day according to the strict principle of justice that Job and his friends have where you punish every evil person at every moment with precise retribution um and he says if i did that i would have to shake humanity from the rug of creation isn't that like yeah, that, i just think that's really like um and that leads him to the last point um which i just love that that we want we want we think we want god to wor- work according to our definition of justice but that would do mass and then um he describes god describes these two fantastic creatures the bohemoth and the leviathan who some people and i think this is wrong think are poetic descriptions of the hippo or a whale or a crocodile but technically if you read it a, a hippo or a whale doesn't really fit these animals it doesn't match the description all we know is that they're very very huge um and um so it just makes you think are there and this was a point are there creatures out there in creation that are so huge they would frighten us if we saw them, that we don't even know about like i like to think about that do you, you know what i mean um um i know this sounds right but they were talking about these nebulas um in this one ted talk and the nebula if you look at it one way it seems to have intelligence there's these patterns to the nebula so is this just an inorganic nebula or is this nebula a form of life that we've just never encountered does that make sense and so he shows god shows him these two creatures that he's quite proud of but he warns them um they're not they're not evil cuz job thinks because they're so powerful they must be evil so they're not evil but they're not safe either and the point is that god's world is very amazing it is amazing creation but it's not safe it, like life is wonderful it has order and beauty but it's also very dangerous um and does that make any sense and there is suffering in the beauty um and it doesn't matter if it's from earthquakes or wild animals or or um cancer or sickness God doesn't really explain it. What he explains is that we live in a very complex world that maybe sometimes suffering is not a bad thing. So he doesn't Job God doesn't uh, answer Job's question of why they're suffering. He just basically says, "Job, I'll answer your question if you can answer my questions." And Job can't. And then he says, "Job, you don't have the language for me to explain it, even if I could explain it." you're the one that lacks the language to understand it does that make any sense so it basically says in the end your one choice is to trust um that maybe justice looks a little bit different and job expla- wants to have a full explanation but it's job who couldn't understand god's answer 
And so basically you have to wait. But then there's a strange conclusion that um, Job says, well, what about the three friends? And this is kind of scary. God says their punishment is that they have to live out that theology. Now, remember it started with um, God saying, look at my Job. He's so innocent. He will never turn against me. And here's the really odd part. Job, at the very end, gets angry with God. But even then, God says, you were faithful. Job questioned everything, even thought maybe God was a bully. But God is right. You still remained faithful to me. No, so Jews had to wrestle with this. What do you mean? You can get angry at God? You can question God, knowing full well that you're the one who can't receive the answer? And that is a form of faithfulness. So um, um, the famous Jewish commentator... Uh, whose name I'm skipping on now. Um, he wrote a guide for the perplexed. Maimonides. Maimonides said, now Job gives you this example of what it means to be a faithful human being. That to be a faithful human being, to say yes to God, means that you have to question everything. You know, when you're healthy and have wealth and security and everything, it's easy to say yes to God. But maybe your way of saying yes to God in your old age when you have suffering is to question everything, even suffering itself, even your definition of justice, that God is the most, I'm sorry, Job is the most faithful human being because he questioned and then still trusted God without an answer. Um, so um, does that make any sense? Like. People, like the guy who says, oh, no, you like, have to be like a dog and just obey. Maybe the example of um, faithfulness is when you question everything and then still have to rely on trust and simply admit that maybe God's wisdom doesn't fit our logic. Um, does that make any sense? I keep thinking of his ways are not our ways. Does that come from the Bible? <coughs> Yes, it does come from the Bible. Yeah, but his ways are, or it, Job reminds me of a, like a child who, you know how children will always say why? You know, wh but why? Well, you don't have the language to answer why. In the end, you have to say, just trust me. You, you know, like, or let's say you have a child and you tell your child, don't ever lie. And then let's say you're in the Holocaust and to save people's lives, you lied about it. And your child says, but you lied. And I said, I know, but... <coughs> Sorry. There's a bigger picture going on. But you lied. <laughs> Why'd you lie? Well, you know, it only makes sense if you could see the bigger picture. You can't really answer the why to a child, and maybe God can't answer the why. <coughs> but, sorry. Um, I do like the idea that a faithful human being questions. A faithful human being accepts suffering but still doesn't have an answer why. And do not be like the three friends that blame the victim. Because you, you see that constantly. Every TV evangelist always does it. You know, you know, a natural disaster hits Houston and God hates you, Houstonians. I don't know what you call them. Um, all, Job, all God really asks Job is really... Bring your pain honestly and your grief honestly to God. Question and grief and even complaining out to God may be a, a way of faithfulness. So, then the twist is this. After that, God restores Job's family. Job gets it all back. Not only all back, but it gets kind of complicated. He gets twice as much back in some cases. Seven times much back in other cases. And to me... That's a strange ending, but it reminds me of heaven. That in the end, everything will be restored and we'll have more than enough. We'll, we'll have our family back and even seven times as much family. But it was not the same life, right? In this story, yes, because they don't have a development of the afterlife yet. But, yes. I thought that days of a it's a new family. family. But that, for a Christian, that makes a good image of where well, heaven isn't this new family. I'm Christianizing him. But he gets it all back. But there's really kind of some important questions that this book raises. Lord, do you have a question or just fixing no, your hair? <laughs> I hate hair in my eyes. I also like the fact that Job, who's a foreigner, 
not part of the chosen people, is the most faithful. So. Yeah, um, related to my question before and also present life, I think we can confuse suffering with endurance. Uh, I know people who just feel that living life is suffering, very pessimistic people, but they, they kind of suffer through life. They, I think some religions kind of push that. Uh, all of life is, is um, you know, this day of tears and that kind of stuff. And um, you, you endure that, you survive it, you suffer through it. In, in one sense, I have to admit, I kind of agree. But, like, um, like, I like the Iliad, that all of life is a journey. But I also like um, the Neid, that all of life is a battle. I uh, mix those two up. Uh, I also think, yeah, all of life is suffering, but that's not bad. You know, there's beauty in suffering. Like, I wouldn't want to just endure the suffering for the sake of enduring, but if you could be, no offense, like my dad, where you suffer, and in the suffering, wow, you find great beauty. It didn't alleviate his pain or the loss of his dignity, but, you know, he, he ended up half it. So if you said, are you suffering to my dad? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> are you happy? Yeah, a lot. Like, it, you could be... Like, I feel sorry for people who only have half the equation of, well, I'm going to endure this, but it doesn't lead to any great gold. So. One thing that I always related to and people do to is that they related job with patient. Because even when you do a um, crossword, they ask you, person with a lot of patient is supposed to be job. And um, so, but then you're putting on that patient because at the end he's not dead. So I wonder why they stay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I always associate Job with suffering, so. Yeah, but, but if you look, you know, even in Jeopardy, sometimes one of the questions, yeah. <laughs> the answer is Job. And they said, it's a person with a lot of patience. So that's what I don't... Well, I can't challenge Jeopardy because <laughs> Alec Trebek is always right. The, the other thing is, this sounds kind of strange, so how to like spiritualize, I know this sounds kind of strange. Like, I like Job. And as I said, you must deal with Job if you want to gain wisdom. So I, I kind of spiritualize it this way. Like, I'm not Job yet, um, but... And this is going to sound strange, but like I think one of the key lives is trying to make space for becoming vulnerable. And a certain amount of people don't want to be vulnerable. They want sure answers for everything. Or, you know, I love God, so God shouldn't make me suffer. But I think you have to deal with the experience of suffering. So this is my job thing as well. Yeah, life always starts out great, but then at a certain point, it becomes loss upon loss upon loss. So why not pray the loss? So this sounds kind of strange. My idea is that, well, let's say I meet somebody who's like, this guy died of, of um, pancreatic cancer. And to be honest, it was, and pancreatic cancer is short, brief, tenacious, and painful. But having gone with, you know, seen him through it, it's actually, this sounds awful. It's not that bad. I could, I could deal with pancreatic cancer. Do you, now this sounds kind of strange. It's like, I imagine myself being that person. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so it just seems like all of us have to f have a, ultimately a way to shed the physicality to get into the pure spiritual relationship with God at the end. So it's going to be something that is a way of shedding it, whether it be pancreatic cancer, and so we call it suffering, the discontent, so that so that we're ready to move on to the pure spiritual relationship with God without all the physicality. This creation could I, was just... Could I say a pure relationship, not pure physical? Because well, the problem... the physical. I know, but, like, I, this sounds kind of... This is my other position of Job, and mm -hmm. I'll try and articulate this, but have you ever met some religions, um, especially New Age religions, where it's all just spiritual? You know, it's just... It, they overuse the word spiritual, but... I am my body, and 
Catholics have a very sacramental theology of you know getting in the we anoint the body, we bless the body, we immerse the body. But like any times I meet these um, kind of over spiritualized New Agers, it's always this spiritual union with God that really lacks the body. It's actually at the end, right? I'm saying, but no, oh, I know, I know what you meant at the very end, but. You know, how I relate to God is through my body. And for, for, for a while, I relate to it as, you know, God, I'm in great health, I can do everything, but now I'm starting to lose my eyesight. And now, and it's very humbling. And every, like, I am, my relationship with my God is through my body. It's not this just spiritual relationship. So, like, I know that's gonna happen to my body, so why wouldn't I imagine myself like, does that mean, like, I, I don't want to over, over spiritualize the relationship with God because I think it, I think it becomes a, a roadblock if you do when everything starts falling apart. I, I, I know what you meant. You meant the falling apart purifies you, and I get that. Right. But have you ever, have you ever noticed, like, people, I think you're setting yourself up for <coughs> disillusionment if you think it's just this spiritual relationship between me and God. But my relationship with God is through my body, and what am I going to do when my body starts completely breaking down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think about people who live completely handicapped and at the mercy of their environment and what it must be like to be inside that. Uh, so I, I, I imagine that all the time, thinking, what would that do to me? And you might as well, like, I know this sounds strange, you might as well, my position is well, why wouldn't I? I just think there's great wisdom there to put myself in that position because it could be me, and it doesn't mean that God doesn't love me. But does that make any sense? Like, I, I that didn't make any sense to you. No, it makes sense, but sometimes I think it can be in our head that yes, suffering brings us to God, but when you're actually seeing a loved one waste away, I had a sister who was diagnosed with diabetes when she was 10. And her and I, extremely close, we always knew she was gonna die at a young age. And we talked about it freely, that she was ready any time to go home to the Lord. But the last couple of years, it was extremely difficult. We never lost our faith. She never lost her faith, I didn't either. But the suffering, I would never want to go through it again because it was extremely difficult. So you can know it in your head, but then when you actually live through it, I mean, it's hard. It really is. No, don't mean to belittle it, yeah. Same thing with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. But once you go through it, I don't know. I, I, there's also great gold there. I, I like it. A world without suffering, I don't think, would make us as... I know it's hard, but I think there's gold there. Um, the other thing, like, other people suffering... Uh, this sounds kind of cruel. Other people suffering, I do think, also becomes great inheritance for the next generation. The, of what's important and what's not. And so, I'm glad my nephews got to see their grandfather like that. He was both happy and suffering. He was both in pain and in love with life, more than he was when he was healthy. So my problem is there's just no way to, you, you kind of have to experience it firsthand. And it's not beautiful or fun, but it's also rich. I don't know, I'm not. When you were, the other day before this class, you were mentioning that um, Job have all this distress and his sulfur and all that. And his friends come over and for how long do they just sit there and then say anything? Oh, I'm not sure how long. I think it's three days that they didn't say anything. And then they start to impose their theology. And that's a dangerous part. Like, I wouldn't want to go to some little kid who's suffering and have him say, well, why am I suffering? I wouldn't mention Joe because how does a little kid relate? You know, like, I think it's best just to remain quiet sometimes, yeah, even yeah. if I have opinions. Yeah, I think you mentioned it, like, a lot of times we know somebody that is going through a loss or whatever, 
and then you just don't have words to say anything. Sometimes you it's wait best. Until that other person starts talking, and then maybe it would be better not to mention what they're going through. Just talk to them. Just be there, because otherwise, if you impose the wrong theology, you make their suffering worse. So, yeah. Well, I hate to be rude, but I got a funeral, so...